We have a mission to share our story with others so that they will see and understand God's goodness and grace. Join us today as Pastor Lemon continues his series, What's Your Story? Take your Bible with me today and open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I have just one more message in this series after today, and I will bring it obviously next Sunday morning. And we're going to turn our focus a little bit today from the story that God wants us to tell to the reasons why we ought to tell it and the motivation for sharing our story. I hope that if you have been coming for a long time or you've only been coming for just a few weeks that you know what is the heartbeat of our church. Everything we do, everything we try to do, ultimately is about reaching somebody else with the gospel of Jesus Christ, reaching someone else with the good news that Jesus saves. So whether it's a program that we're running or it's a church service like this or whether it's a life group or whether it's an activity we're having, whether it's caring for our facilities and the things that we do, everything, everything is geared for reaching another person with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I suggest to you that if our church isn't, do that, isn't doing that and seeking to do that with all of our hearts, we might as well just shut the doors and go on and do something else. God has left us here to be a light in this world. He's left us here to be the salt of the earth. He's left us here to introduce other people to our Savior. That's why it's important that we know our faith story. That's why it's important that we understand our faith story. And I'm going to be honest with you. Before I began this series, the reason why it's been shaped as it has been shaped is because I know that sitting amongst us and watching us, there are people who are religious, who know ceremonies, who've been through rituals. Maybe they've been baptized. Maybe they consider themselves to be good people. But the fact of the matter is you're lost in your sin. You need to receive Christ as your Savior. You need to be born again. You need to become a child of the living God. I know that not because I know your story specifically. I just know that sitting in a crowd this large on a Sunday in two different services, that there are people amongst us who don't know Jesus. And so for four weeks, I've been trying to get you to think about your faith story. Not only for those of you that are already believers in Jesus, I wanted you to think about it so that you could begin to use that as, the, the, uh, as a, a tool that you will share with others the gospel of Jesus. But I shared about the faith story that we are lost, separated from God, without hope. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot change our circumstances spiritually that Jesus came and he paid that penalty for us and now he offers a gift to us that we receive through grace, uh, by grace and through faith. By grace and through faith. So that we receive the gift of eternal life that can never be taken away from us. And we begin a relationship with God that is an ongoing relationship of discipleship where we're growing and learning more about him, where we're becoming increasingly more like him, where we're making disciples who live in love like Jesus. I went back through that part of the faith story and helping you to know the faith story because some of you, to be honest with you, don't have that story. You, you didn't come to a place where you recognized you were a sinner in need of the Savior. You haven't received Christ. Uh, through faith, by grace, through faith. You don't possess today the gift of eternal life, and God is not real in your life every single day where, where you're walking with him and you're learning more about him and you're growing in his likeness. And my burden and my heart is for you to be saved. As a matter of fact, we, we could stop the service at this moment and give you an opportunity to trust in Jesus Christ and we will have accomplished 
what God wanted me to accomplish with this series of messages. But today I want to come to you and I want to tell you that we've got to take our story of faith, how we came to know Jesus, how we changed our lives. It's going to be different for every one of us. The basics of the story are the same for all of us. But how our lives interact with those basics is unique to each of us. We've got to take that story, our story, and we've got to start sharing it with other people. We've got to start talking about that story because there's a whole lot of people that won't come to church and won't give me the opportunity to share the gospel. But they're in your lives. They're in your network of family and friends. They're around you. And you are to be the ambassador, God's representative to those people in your life to introduce them to Jesus Christ. Now, you can't save them. You can't make them trust in Christ. But you can be God's representative amongst them to introduce them to Jesus Christ. And that can't just be the task of the pastors on our church staff. That can't just be the responsibility of the deacons and the life group leaders. That is the responsibility, according to Scripture, that is committed to every single one of us. There are no exceptions. If you are a believer in Jesus, he is your Savior. You are the possessor of eternal life. You are in a relationship with Christ. It may not be all that you want it to be, but you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have a responsibility to be God's representative and ambassador to those that are around you. I can't be an ambassador to everybody in your life, and you can't be an ambassador to everybody in my life. But together, all of us being ambassadors where we are, sharing our faith story and how Jesus changed our lives is how we see other people's lives changed. But inevitably, somebody says, well, why? Why should I do that? Well, I can think of a lot of reasons, but I'm going to give you four reasons today that are found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 11. Let me set the stage for you for just a moment. When Paul writes 2 Corinthians, it's about two years or so after he wrote the first letter. If you don't know this, the Apostle Paul went to Corinth and he spent 18 months in the city of Corinth preaching the gospel, winning people to Christ, establishing a church. When he left the city of Corinth, there were a lot of problems that had to be addressed, things that were beginning to rise up. And so he writes 1 Corinthians back to them to address some of those issues, to address some of those problems. One of those problems that had arisen was that people had come to Corinth and they had tried to undermine the Apostle Paul. They had tried to undermine his ministry. They had tried to undermine his authority. They had tried to undermine his character. And so under the inspiration of God, Paul sits down and he writes this letter, 2 Corinthians, and he sends it to them. And if you will, this is not all that it is, but if you will, Paul is giving a defense of his ministry. And he's telling you why he does what he does. And in telling you why he does what he does, he's telling us why we should do what we should do. He's giving us the motivation for what kept him going and what keeps him going. And I think if you know much about the Apostle Paul, you, you would agree that, that he had to have been, other than Jesus, potentially the greatest missionary who ever lived. But he's telling you in the fifth chapter here, th this is my motivation. Th this is the reason why I did what I do why I kept going when I was beaten and I was left for dead, when they tried to stone me with rocks, when I went without sleep, when I didn't have food to eat, when I was shipwrecked and left at sea, when I was persecuted, when I was in prison. This is why I did what I do. This is why I kept going. This is why everybody should be a witness for Jesus Christ. 
And in sharing it in chapter 5, he gives four reasons why you and I should be concerned about other people, about their eternal souls, and why we must do more than just uh, simply live around people and say nothing about Jesus. We must speak up. And the first is the fear of the Lord. You'll notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, what he says. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. I want you to look back just one verse to verse 10. When he talks here about the terror of the Lord, listen in the context in which he's speaking. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or, ba- or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, knowing that there is this judgment. There are four judgments that are yet to come. There's the judgment of the nations. It takes place at the end of the tribulation and going into the millennium when God will separate the nations, those that were turned toward the nation of Israel and those that were turned against the nation of Israel. There's the judgment of the angels. It's found in 1 Corinthians. It's still a little bit mysterious because it says you and I are going to be involved in the judgment of the angels, meaning those that are the fallen angels, that are the demons of this world. And then there is the one that most of us, or at least many of us, know the great white throne judgment. It happens all the way at the end of the Revelation when everybody who was an unbeliever, everybody who has rejected Jesus Christ will be judged and finally death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire forever and forever and forever following that judgment. But there's one other judgment. Actually, this judgment is the judgment that comes before those previous three that I've just mentioned. And it's not a judgment for the unbeliever. It's a judgment for the believer. And the judgment is not about whether you get into heaven or not. That judgment was settled at Calvary. When Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, the Father judged our sins on his own Son. And when we trust Jesus, what he paid gets credited for our sin debt or to our sin debt so that it's canceled out. But at the judgment seat of Christ, we will stand and we will give an account for the works that we do whether they honored God or whether they didn't, whether they are works that should be rewarded or not rewarded. The Greek word here for the judgment seat is the bema seat. In the the Greek games, they had a raised platform, and the judges would sit on the raised platform, and they would watch the athletes as they were performing. And then the athletes would come, and they would stand before the judges, and the judges would give out the rewards, and they would disqualify some, but give out the rewards to others. And you and I are going to stand before the judgment seat. It isn't going to determine whether we go to heaven, but it determines, determines whether we're going to have rewards as we're in heaven and as we serve him in the kingdom that is to come, the judgment seat of Christ. And the apostle Paul says, knowing that that judgment is yet to come, knowing the terror of the Lord. The word terror is the Greek word phobos. You can hear our word phobia. Knowing the terror of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord, what do we do? What do we do? We persuade men. Number two, we should be motivated as he was by a perfect love. In verses 12 and 13, he goes on with his argument about what people are saying. In essence, what he says is this. I'm not telling you these things because I'm trying to commend myself to you. You already know who I am. And I know they're calling me into question and they're calling my conduct into question and my character into question. I'm just giving you an understanding 
and a reminder of who I am so that you'll have reason to boast to them. In other words, you'll have reason to speak up to them on my behalf. But then he comes to verse 14, and he says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Do you hear what he says? Not only is he motivated by a future judgment, he is motivated by this perfect love. Three times in verses 14 and 15, he speaks of the sacrifice of Christ. He died for all. He died for all. At the end of verse 15, him who died for them and rose again. He died. He died. He died. There is no greater display of love than the display of love that Jesus has given for us. That love that took took him from heaven to earth, that love that took him to the cross where he was nailed and suffered and died and bled on our behalf, that love that raised him from the grave and ascended back to the Father, that love is a motivator for me. That God would love me that much, how can I not speak up on his behalf to others, knowing that God loves them just as much? I want them to know. And did you notice the scope of that love? He says that he died for all, and he died for all, and he died for all. I'm sorry, I don't believe that he only died for some. I believe the death of Jesus was sufficient for every man who's ever lived or ever will live until Jesus Christ comes again. And this isn't the only place that argues from that point. And changing these words to mean something else is a ridiculous way to handle the Scripture because the Bible speaks in terms that we can understand, not just for a few select ones to tell us what it means. He died for all. He died for all. He wants us to know that there is a universalism in the scope of his death. This is not universalism in the sense that everybody goes to heaven. This is a universalism in the scope of his death. Nobody is left out. And that is the amazing love of God for us. Listen to what someone has written. There is universalism in the scope of redemption since no person is excluded from God's offer of salvation, but there is a particularity in the application of redemption since not all people appropriate the benefits afforded by this universally offered salvation. Nobody's excluded. That means the people in your life, you you don't have to ask the question, is he elected or is she not elected? Is that one elected or that one not elected? The death of Jesus was for every man, woman, boy, and girl. And nobody is beyond the scope of his death. It's universal in its scope, in its reach. Anyone who hears the gospel and believes in Jesus becomes the child of the living God. Not just a few select ones. And what greater love can that be? Paul says... I'm motivated by perfect love. Number three, he says, I'm motivated by a changed perspective. He moves along in verse 16 and 17. He says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him thus no longer. In other words, he says, I used to know Christ. I thought of him as a rabbi. I knew him as a teacher. I thought he was subversive. I wanted to silence his followers. I didn't see him as he really was. That's how I used to look at him. That's how I look at men. I look through my eyes and I think what I see, but I don't always know the full story. There was more to Jesus, wasn't there? A whole lot more to Jesus. And there's more to other stories than what we see or what we sometimes hear. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, I want you to notice the word he is, or words, he is, are in italics. 
It is just as likely that it should be translated, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. I could spend time arguing that point with you for a few moments. The point is the new creation, certainly when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're made new because you're born again. But on this occasion, in this context, where he says, I'm not looking at people the way I used to look at people. Now I have come to a new worldview. Now I have come to see a different perspective on people. I've come into a new creation, a new worldview. The way I used to see people in the old is past, and the way I see people now in the present is altogether different. In other words, he was saying, in essence, that the motivation was that I now see people the way the Lord sees them, and I now understand people's greatest need, the need of the gospel, the need of God's forgiveness. Paul is saying that our worldview changes when we're born again. Some have everlasting life and are part of God's forever family. Others lack everlasting life, and unless they come to faith before they die, they will spend eternity separated from us and from God forever. And just to shorten this particular section, it means that we see people the way God sees people. We see them as lost and in need of the Savior. Lost and in need of the Savior. I wish I had time to take you to Mark chapter 10, but you can go there later on. There's a section in the middle of Mark chapter 10. The children want to come to Jesus. And the disciples think to, that Jesus doesn't want to be bothered with the children, so they push him away. No, you, no don't, don't bother Jesus. Don't bother Jesus. And Jesus stops them and says, no, 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 no. Don't you push those children away. And he lets the children come to him, and he takes them in his lap, and he loves them. Because Jesus sees in those children that they need to be loved. But then the story that comes immediately after it is the story of the rich man, the young rich man. He comes to Jesus with his arrogance, and he comes to Jesus with his pride, and he comes to Jesus having... uh, you know, seeing himself as self-righteous. I do all of the commands. I do everything I'm told to do. Therefore, I should be given entrance into, into eternity with God. And of course, Jesus shows him that in fact he isn't as good as he thinks he is. But there's an interesting little phrase in that story. It says, Jesus looked at him. Are you with me? Jesus looked at him and loved him you would think that jesus would love the children but here is a man who in his arrogance and in his pride and his self-righteousness comes presenting himself as somebody who doesn't really need what jesus has to offer jesus looks at him and it says jesus loved him you realize how god sees people this new perspective it's one of the reasons that I hear some teaching and preaching where it makes, it makes it sound like God is angry all the time and he's looking at everybody with a scowl on his face and he's just looking for the opportunity to take it out, his anger out on them. When in actuality what the scripture teaches us is that God sees us and he sees our brokenness and he loves us in the midst of it and he brings his son to us so that we can be saved from our sins. Are you with me? Number four, he was motivated by a high calling. He was motivated by a high calling. You'll notice as he goes on here, verse 18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God, here it comes, were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. You understand that There's two sides to reconciliation. There's an objective side and a subjective side. 
Dr. Thomas Constable says reconciliation removes a barrier to our salvation, but it does not by itself accomplish our salvation. Or one of my favorite preachers who's now in heaven, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and if I could mimic his accent, I would mimic it. He writes, now that Christ has died, the position of the world has been changed. Today, God has his arms outstretched to a lost world. He says to a lost world, you can come to me. The worst sinner in the world can come to him. Today, it doesn't make any difference who you are. You can come to him because Christ died. A holy God no longer deals with us in judgment. That's the objective side of it. But now he reaches down to save all those who will come to him. Jesus Christ bore all that judgment on himself so that now the world is reconciled to God. That's the objective side of it. The world is reconciled to God. You don't have to do anything to win God over. God is not waiting around the corner to hit you over the head with a billy club. God is not angry with you. God does not hate you. God loves you. There's a perfect love that's been given to you. How can you not tell others how Jesus has cured your greatest problem? He has made you to be his ambassador. He has made you to be his representative in this world. He has given to you a high calling, and he's changed the way we look at people, and we no longer see them. Listen, politics turns the mission field into our enemy. I'm all about voting for the right person. I'm all about voting for the right policies, which is likely what we're going to have to do this time. Voting for the right policies. But hear me. Those people that don't look like you and vote like you and aren't like you are the mission field. And God puts you there to be an ambassador on his behalf to show them God is reaching out to you. He's reaching out to you. Let me tell you how he changed my life. Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you why you need to come to Jesus. Thanks for joining with us today, and we hope this message has made a difference for you. If you'd like more information about The Daily Walk or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, then please contact us. We'd love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.